Okay, everybody, we are going to get started now. Uh, in terms of announcements, in terms of announcements, uh, your next homework assignment is up and available for you to get started on. It's using Google Test to test your assignment, and so the Google Test stuff has been provided for you. That means when you're starting your project, make sure that you start with a copy of what I give you for your project instead of starting your own, because the CMake lists uh, that I'm using are a little bit complicated. So make sure that you only use a copy from them. You can, of course, modify the CMake list in the matrix directory. I should show you. You're pretty much free to modify anything inside this subdirectory. So if you needed to add more classes or remove more classes, you can totally do that. But you're not going to want to touch anything else. And again, you're going to want to start from this base. If you try to do things on your own, you're probably not going to be able to accomplish it. We will talk a little bit more about Google Tests later on in the quarter, um, but I also encourage you to look at the tests that are there. You've hopefully done your readings, or if you haven't, please do start. Or please do take care of those uh, for Google Test. Um, but it does make your life a little bit easier in verifying that what you're doing is working, um, because it allows you to fairly easily test, like on a per method level whether everything is working like you expect to work. But we're gonna pick up on Git today, unless you guys have any questions before we get started. Okay, so last time we talked about pushing and pulling, so we'll show how to do a pull. So over here, I'm going to edit the file directly on um, GitHub. Right, so we edit our file, and then, you know, might say, said some nice things about the world. And then commit changes. Uh, again, normally these additional changes would probably happen and get up there from your partner working on things versus you direct, directly editing stuff. So now if I want to get those changes, I can do version control git, and if I say fetch, it's only going to pull down the changes from that branch, but it's not going to incorporate them into the branch at all. And we should see that we have some, you can see the history down here. You can see that something new has happened uh, on my branch, this main branch over here. And we have this little slide branch that split off from our Spanish version. So now I should be able to, this is control shift tilde, and if you do like origins faster, I could say merge into current, but normally how you're gonna end up going about doing this is version control, uh, git pull, and I want to merge them into uh, the remote branch is origin, branches to merge origin master, so we pull, And you can see I now have the changes in there, right? No difference. Does that make sense? So let's say I go, this is like the nice fast forward commit because the commit that we had on uh, GitHub was just a little bit farther ahead. There were no differences, but sometimes you're going to end up with differences um, from what you and your partner have done. So you might modify the same line. So I might say, hello, beautiful world here. And then commit the changes here on GitHub. Again, normally your partner would be doing the changes on their own machine. And then over here, I'm gonna say like, hello, ugly world. And then make a commit over here. Uh, is dirty or something. So now, now, now notice those two lines are different. So if I attempt to do like a git push, uh, it's going to fail now because the branches aren't the same. I'm not just a little bit ahead of where the current branch is at. We've deviated. So now if I do version control git pull, 
right? Again, we want to pull down the changes. And you can see, oh, right, that uh, Git has put uh, some of these lines in here where things are different. You can see that the head, that's what's on uh, our branch. And then this guy over here is what's on the um, branch that was on GitHub that we pulled down where it says beautiful. And so now we have this option of saying what we want to do. So we would go over to merge and it'll load the files for merge. The result guy is here in the middle and you can choose to either like take the guy from the left, take the guy from the right. Guy from the right is the um, one that we're merging uh, uh, into our branch. This is our current branch and this is going to be the result. So you can say take from the left, take from the right, I don't want this. You can take from both the left and the right. You can somehow combine those two things together, right? It's all up to you in terms of what makes sense and how to resolve this difference. Um, sometimes you might want the right version so you can um, accept their version. Sometimes you want your version so you can accept your version, right? If you want all of your changes or all of their changes. But if you need to do some mixture of those changes, it's up to you to figure out what you want to have happen. So for example, we could say this one, I believe would take from the right. And now we could say take from the left. And you can see this has like been resolved now. We resolved the changes and we decided to take from both of them. That may not be what you want to do, but you can go ahead and you can edit it to be something different instead. Does that make sense? This is like the most annoying part of having to deal with Git and multiple people working, working is dealing with these merge conflicts. We might say apply, and we get a new version um, where we have both of those things brought in. So we talked about merge conflicts on the command line. There are some options you could do. You could do git checkout ours, which will click, select your version of the file, or git checkout theirs, which will accept their version. Or again, when you're merging, uh, uh, C line will prompt you if you want yours or theirs, or you can do the merge like I just did. Uh, so rebasing is somewhat similar to merging, but it kind of replays the changes that you have uh, on in your current branch onto the branch that you're rebasing onto. Um, this is one of those things that's a little bit destructive. Um, so be careful when doing it. So like here's like an example where we have our current version, then there's the experiment. If we merged it into our current branch, here's master and they're now merged into, right? So we can see we have our old version, uh, the new version, and we can see that we pulled from both of them from master and experiment to get our new version C5. Or what we could do is we could replay these commit changes in C4 on top of master. So now it looks like there was no divergence at all. So the rebasing can be helpful if you want to like clean up your commit history and make it look nice, but you do need to be really careful about doing it as it's one of those things that cannot be easily undone in Git, whereas pretty much everything else can be fairly easily undone. So if you do want to rebase, you probably want to follow this one rule, only rebase work done on local branches. So if you've ever pushed a branch up to the um, to your GitHub account or to your Git server, uh, don't rebase onto it anymore because now other people have access to it and things are going to get screwy if people start to try merging or doing other work on it. So if you do some local changes, right, you create a new branch on your own machine, you do some changes, make a few commits on that one, and then you want to rebase onto the master because you haven't pushed that branch, that's perfectly fine. But if that branch ever goes up onto the server, don't rebase anymore onto it. That makes sense. So only rebase on your local versions. Uh, you can also access older commits. A uh, git log will show you, and then these hash numbers, and you can say git checkout to get the hash number. At the bottom, you kind of already see it under the version control tab. You can select log, and this will allow you to go back to previous versions. So you can see here, I clicked on version control, and then I went over to the log tab. And this shows how things are happening. So if I want to, I can go back to say my first commit. I can click on here, right click, say, uh, check out revision. 
Oops. I'll check out. Got it. Uh, yeah, we did the merge. Again, you can't switch to other branches if your current branch is dirty. You can say check out revision, and now we've gone back in time or on that, that particular version of the file. All right, it doesn't look like much has changed because again, small file, but now I'm back to that previous version of the assignment. Like if you want to see like a more complicated somewhat history, um, like here's the commit history for me working on your assignment. <laughs> What you think, you know, it looks a little bit more complicated than it probably needs to. Um, and some things have happened in the background that got committed that I don't think I intended to get committed. Or it looks like it did some, oh, some of these other things that you're seeing in the background, these are from the stuff that I pulled from Google Test. That's why it's a lot more complicated than it is. Um, there's probably something where you can s probably say like highlight my my commits, and you can show different things, right? But this is like a more complex history of what's gone on in a project because Google Tests is showing up there as part of my sub build. But anyway. Uh, sometimes you might want to get access to an older version of the file because you know it's bug free or something. Uh, if you want to undo some work and you haven't committed, you can do git check out some previous version. Or what you can also see uh, that you saw kind of down here in the git log. What we could do is if we go back to our current version, back to master. Check out this one. We go back to our original version. If you go back to an old version, you can right click and you can say revert commit. And that's going to make your most up to date version of your program be this older version. What this ends up doing is like remerging this older version on top of your old on top of your current one. So you can go back here. Or you can say, like, I want to reset the current branch to be here. This will actually merge it in, I think. So you can see that you can go back. Or if you just do some work, you can be like, hi, blah, 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 do, 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 right? And you're like, oh man, I've done all this work and I don't like what I've done. We can go to version control, git revert. Oh, it's gone back. So all that work that I've done since my last commit has now been erased. If for whatever reason you wanted to do that. Or again, you could check out a previous version and then branch it off from there. Uh, so some tips you can freeze and get effectively is just use lots of branches. Again, every time you decide that you want to do something or you're, you're afraid that something might screw things up or you want to add some new functionality, create a new branch for it. It's never going to hurt. Having all of these different versions of your files is never really going to cause you that much of a problem. Um, if you're in the middle of doing the feature and you decide that you want to try something new from here too, that's fine. Branch off your branch, right? And you can branch off your branch off your branch and eventually merge things back in when you finally complete things. Uh, again, also commit frequently. You can only go back to the commits that you've made. So if you do lots of things in between each commit, the amount of change that can happen you know, between each ones will be large. So if you only want to go back a little bit in time, it won't be possible. Um, if you're working with a partner, make sure that you pull frequently. Um, so that you make sure that you have the most up-to-date version of your partner's codes once they've merged things in, so that you're not falling behind. The farther you and your partner's versions of a project deviate from each other, like the farther apart they get, the harder it is going to be to merge them back together. You're gonna end up with more merge conflicts, and so it'll take longer to get it into a consistent state. Um, when you finish doing something, test it right, make sure it's all going good, maybe use Google Tests to do that and then push it back up so that your partner does have access to it. Again, uh, you can see the Git docs and the Git book that I've kind of shared with you. Uh, it is pretty easy reading. It's not that hard and it does have a lot of useful information in it. 
Also, if you're ever like, sh like confused, like how do I do X and Git, Google that topic and you'll find some pe person that's already asked it and you'll get help on it. Do you guys have any questions on Git before we move on? Yeah. So again, you won't be able to push, right, unless the push that you're doing is a fast forward one. A fast forward one is one where you don't have any merge conflicts and you're able to just skip ahead to that next commit. So let's say like your partner's done some changes, right? You pull them in, you get everything, you know, up to stuff, you make a commit. And in that meantime, your partner has done another push onto that branch you're trying to um, push to. When you go to push, you'll fail because it'll be uh, farther ahead of you. You'll have to re-pull your partner's new stuff, again, incorporate it into your version, and then you can push. Um, also, what you can do, again, because all of your repositories should be private, you do have some options in the settings to be able to add collaborators, which is over here in settings. If you go to collaborators, this is how you invite people. This is how you invite people to be able to edit on your account directly. So you go over here and you search them by their full name or their email or whatever their GitHub alias is, and then you'll be able to add them here. And that will allow both you and your partner to contribute to the same project. Any questions before we move on? Okay, now we're talking about us. And apparently that blank is not blank anything. It's kind of silly. That works. Okay, so if you guys have questions, make sure to ask about them. Uh, this topic is one that confuses students a lot when they're first learning it. I promise you though that it's a very simple topic and once you understand kind of what's going on, and it's mainly the syntax that gets in the way of the learning. If you're confused about something, ask, get it clarified, and your life is going to be a lot better than if you keep waiting on it. So the first thing is memory is divided into four sections. Big enough, or do I need to write bigger? Do I need bigger? Okay. So every program is going to be divided, its memory will be divided into these four sections. The text section contains the program's instructions. area of memory, but you cannot write to it. So this means that uh, programs are prevented from writing self-modifying code. So you can have your program go over here and write different instructions instead while it's in the middle of front. So no writing. Other thing is this section of memory is loaded on program start. And it's deleted on program end. Any questions about the text section? This is like where the add, subtract, multiply, divide, move things around. All that code is for your actual like instructions. That's where this stuff goes. 
can't, uh, it's loaded when your program starts, it's deleted when your program ends, right? Um, can't write to it. Only read and execute the instructions that are there. Yeah. Uh, program instructions. There's the data section. This is where global variables and static variables So any variable that you declare as a global variable or a static variable, it shows up in this section of memory, in the data section. They're created on program start. And they're deleted on program end. Can I write darker? Yeah. I think it's the chalk. I can try writing on the overhead instead, but I don't know if it's going to be any better. Do you guys prefer I do the overhead? Sure. So do you guys have any questions about the data section? Yeah. So like this space that's created, it lasts until the program is terminated, right? So when you create a global variable or a um, static variable, it's created as soon as the program starts up, and it will blow up until we didn't pull the program ends. Does that make sense? The text instruction, again, is also created when the program starts, and it's deleted when the program ends. So, like, you know, once your program, like, leaves main, after that's done and your program's completely finished running, that's when the text section and the data section both get deleted. Any other questions? You have the stat. This is for uh, local variables and args. Its space here is created as needed. So space will be created, well, created on function calls. And then they're deleted on function n. So you're, yeah. The stack is, it behaves similar to the data structure of things get pushed and popped onto it. So, like, whenever a function call is made, that function's local variables arguments are pushed onto the stack, right? And when that function uh, ends, that um, those local variables and arguments are removed from the stack that popped off. So it has that similar behavior, but we're not just talking about the stack data type itself. There's a portion of memory referred to as the function stack, what we're talking about right now. Yeah, so like when you create space for a function, right, it's going to last for that function end. That function's going to call another function, right? That function's going to call another function, right? That space that was first created for that first function call is going to be the last one that's deleted because it's the last function that ends. So it has to wait for its function to also finish. So it's where your local variables and arguments are made. Space again here is created as needed. So whenever you create more local variables, you create more arguments, right? That's when the space is made for these variables. Um, the, the space here only lasts for the duration of that function, right? So your local variables and your arguments, they only last for as long as that function. Once the function ends, those things get deleted, right? So this is sometimes referred to as automatic memory, right? Because you can see the space here is being allocated, 
right? Created and destroyed, deallocated as needed, right? You didn't have to do anything special to make it happen. The final section is the key. This is where dynamically allocated variables, dynamically allocated space is created. But you guys haven't done anything with that, which we're going to be talking about today. Uh, it's created. When you say to create it, it's destroyed. When you say to destroy it. And there are function calls that allow you to create this space and delete the space. So a lot of times this is referred to as programmer managed memory. Because you as the programmer are responsible for managing this memory. Right? When you say to create it, it gets destroyed when you say to destroy it. If you don't destroy it when your program ends, what's called a memory leak. Did you guys ever play video games and as you kept playing them, it progressively got slower and slower and slower and slower as time went on, as the line was running? That's already program. That's a memory leak because the program kept asking for more and more and more and more and more memory, but never released the memory when it was done using it. Uh, sometimes these memory leaks can persist even after the application ends. It depends on your operating system. But you want to make sure that when your program ends, you've released all the resources that you need. Any questions about the four sections of memory? Okay. So every variable Right, as we've seen, exists somewhere in memory. And every location in memory has an address. An easy way to kind of envision this, right, is that every building in the world, right, has an address saying where it's located at. The address tells you where it's at in the world. A memory address of a variable also tells you the exact same thing. Where in memory is this thing at? Addresses begin at zero. And work their way up. So different variables have different sizes, which means they occupy more um, out entries in memory than other ones do. For example, a byte is one byte big, so it's only going to, or a character is one byte big, so it only occupies one unit of memory, because memory is byte addressable. So every byte in memory has an address. Uh, integers are about four bytes big, so that means an integer takes up four bytes. So an integer's address would increase by every four. So this guy might be at address 100. 101, 102. This guy over here might be at 13. This guy might be a bit larger. Maybe not 104, 107. Maybe this guy is a bit bigger, so he's at a 1. And then this guy might be, again, maybe something like that, 1. Right? And so I'm just making up numbers here for our addresses. So what we might have in our program, right, is we might have some like chars, like A, B, C. And so this might be A, this might be B, and this might be C. Then we might have like an integer uh, E, right, E, so then D might live here. 
Then we have this larger guy, maybe he's a double. And so he's F, and so he's occupying this location in memory over here. And then um, 115 might be, because I think he's another integer. And he is, so G might be here. And then maybe the last thing is a my class. For my class is some user defined type that you've created, right? Some class, and my class might be um, in my like, uh, right? So each of these is going to live at certain location memory. So what's the address of that? 107, or the address of D? 103, right? Just where it's at. And so these variables might get assigned values later on. So we might have something like down here in our program, like f equals 35, right? So the way that the compiler actually sees this is go to where f is located, which is that address 107, and then go put the value 35 there. Right? So we go serve 35 in this location. Then we might say, you know, g equals 9, and then we go to the location of where g is stored at, and we put the 9 there. Everybody making sense? Is this making sense so far? So, Let's talk about what the ampersand operator means. So the ampersand operator is used in like a few different contexts as you've seen, right? It can be used as like an and, it can be used to signify a reference, and it's also used to get the address of. So if you do this, ampersand var, this is the address of var. Right? So this is how you ask for the address of something. This is different than declaring a reference to something. Remember, the way that you declare a reference is type, reference, var name, var, right? This is a reference. This is the address of. But notice the signatures look very similar. Don't you agree? This is where I think a lot of people get confused when they're working with um, pointers and stuff, is because a lot of the notation is being used a lot. But notice the ampersand is applied to a variable here to get the address. The ampersand is applied to the type to get the reference. You guys have questions on that? Yeah. Is the type of var name the same as var over here? Uh, for doing the reference, yes. The type of uh, var would have to be the same as the type of var name minus the reference. You have to have uh, some var would have to be a type type. For this assignment to make sense, because you can't reference something of a different type. And you couldn't have an integer reference to a double. I believe. Somebody said something? Yeah. But if you move the ampersand from here to here, the type. Space, oh, the, this, again, the white space in C doesn't matter. So the ampersand being here, the ampersand being here, doesn't matter. But the way that I think about things is the type, or the reference is applied to the type. So I put it with the type when I write code. But you can write it with no spaces in here, and it's still going to be correct. Or put the ampersand on the other side, and it'll still be fine. Um, it doesn't matter. So, for example, we might do something like this. Ampersand F. Well, what's ampersand F? It's 107, right? It's the address of F, right? That's 107. If we ask for ampersand A, that's 100, right? If we ask for the address of D, it's 103, right? So the ampersand gives you the address of that variable. Um, you can only use the ampersand operator once per variable. But you couldn't do something like this, ampersand, ampersand, D. Why does it make sense that you can't do this? Really mean anything. It's like, what's the address of the address of D? Right? It's like asking, like, what's the address of the address of your house? Right? Your house has an address, 
But does your house's address have an address? No, and you're asking the same thing here. You'd be like, okay, well, the address of D, right, is 103. Well, what's, you know, this address's address? I mean, it doesn't make sense to ask, and this is equal to actually right. Well, generally, in you'll need access to like addresses when you start to dynamically allocate space, um, which we'll see in like a little bit. But when you create space for a variable using the new keyword on the heap, it will give you back a pointer to that space. You're going to need to store that location in memory of where that thing is at. A lot of times, these pointers and the addresses show up way more in C, like even C plus plus, because in C plus plus you have the reference type. And that reference type allows you to directly avoid pointers, which is a good thing because then you don't make mistakes. With them. But on your homework assignment after the matrix one, probably won't use the ampersand, but you're definitely going to be using pointers. So the next thing is a pointer. And a pointer, it stores an address. So all pointers do are store addresses. They don't do anything else besides that. The way that you declare a pointer to some type is its type star bar. And what you can do is you can kind of read this backwards. Bar name is a pointer to some type. Pointer to a variable. So again, if we go back to our previous thing, right, we had D. Right, so I might have something like integer pointer IP is equal to the address of P. So if we look back here, what value is IP going to get? Okay. Just 103. Again, um, for the addresses, they are just numbers, but they're numbers that aren't meant, they're, meant, they're numbers that are meant to be interpreted as locations in memory. Right? So literally, IP really does have the value 103. So that 103 is supposed to be interpreted as location 103 in memory. Right? So we might have, what can be really helpful when you're working with uh, variables is to, uh, the point is to do this little chart to like a variable bar or value address. So you have like A, B, C, D, e, E, F, G, e, H. And so here we have 100, and have value 101, 100, 101, 102, 103, 107, uh, I guess we didn't actually have a D. Here it is. 107, 150. So over here, you might just make up some values. So maybe A has the letter G, B has the value Z, E has the value Y, D has the value 19, F has the value 35, G, 5, this, that G has the value 9, and my class maybe has maybe it's true. Yes. Right, so when we do something like this, integer pointer IP, all we do is we create a new variable, IP. I'm just going to make up some address. Maybe it's that address uh, 124. And it has the value. What values we said was the address of D. So we get a D. Look at its address. Its address is. Right? Or I might have something like character pointer cp equals the address of, say, c. So 
So I create a new variable, C, maybe it's at 125. What value does CP have? Right, so CP is equal to the address of C. So you look at C, its address is 102, so CP's value must be 102. Does this make sense? Hopefully things should be seeming very basic right now. Because they're not going to be very complicated, just the syntax. So you can have pointers to other things, like you can have so you can have pointers to pointers. That's completely legal. If you want to point to something of type X, you must be at least one more, you might have you must have at least one more star in your type than X does. So if you want to a pointer to X and X has type the pointer must be at least D-star, right? So that's like IP points at D, D type is an integer, so IP type is a pointer. CP right is pointing to a character, so CP type is char star, char right? So for example, I have something like this. Let's say I want to be able to have a variable called IPP that's equal to the address of IP. What must the type of IPP be in accordance to our little rule above? In star star, right? Two stars. And so if we do this, right, we create a new variable. Maybe it's at 130. What value is inside IPP? Three point five. Right, it's equal to the address of. Okay, so look at IP. We said its address is 1.4. So IP must have the address 1.4, right? And you can go. If like if we wanted, for example, the address of IPPP, what would its type be of this expression? Star star, right? Three stars, right? Uh, if you have a pointer to some type, uh, you can't cannot easily make it point to uh, something else. So if I have like my integer pointer, I can't really make it point at something that's not a type integer very easily. So I couldn't make it like point at X. I would need a double pointer to be able to point that out. Any questions? Okay, so now there's just, yeah. Oh, the values are going to inside? Yeah, I'm completely making them up. Right? And so, like, if you're doing this, which I, I feel like a lot of students find very helpful, just make up the values for the addresses later on. Just make up some value for the address and use it, but then just consistently use that same value every time you take it to address. There's a question? Okay. You do like an auto pointer? Uh, you could use auto in this case, yes. Um, so if we did something like auto. And again, the, the PPP is just for, for us to help remember how many pointers it's supposed to be. You can do this, and it is legal. You just have to know what the type of this deduction is going to be before you use it, right? So the type that auto is going to be deduced to is three stars, right? The same type as the side type on the right hand side. But yes, perfectly legal. So here's the final piece of the equation. So you can put a star in front of a pointer, access the value that pointer. 
comes to it. I'll take you back. So again, I'm going to make up some variables over here. Bar, uh, stress, they might be different than the ones that we're using before. Don't worry about it. So we're going to have variables A, B, C, A, B, C. This guy has value 10, 20, 30. And then he might be addressed 100, 101, 102. Again, the numbers over here don't really matter. So again, we're going to have something like in. A is equal to 10, B equals 20, B equals 30. And I can have an integer pointer address as A. We create our new variable IP. This value is going to be what? So now, since I have this pointer IP, if I do star, IP, this is a D reference. What this means is go to the location that IP is pointing to and get the value that's there. So what you can do is look at IP, its value is 100, right? So star IP means go to the location that's held inside IP. So go to address 100 and then get the value that's there. So star IP is equal to Pointer to an integer, right? So yes, this is a pointer to yourself, right? To this integer, correct. Correct. Uh, this, this is a yes, a type my class star, correct. Uh, when you're in uh, const functions though, the ones that have const at the end, the type is a uh, const my class star. Const pointer. You can't change it yourself in that anyway. Yeah. So pointers and references are really similar to each other. Um, we'll talk about that more tonight. Um, but like the major difference that you can think of is that a pointer is like a reference that doesn't always have to refer to something. Right? It's also movable, so you can make it point to different things. So I now could do something like this. IP equals the address of B. So what's going to happen? So IP's value should be assigned the address of B. So what's B's address? 100. So we're going to replace our value in here with 101. And now if I do star IP, what am I going to get? Twenty, right? Again, this means go to the location IP is pointing to, go to the location 101, and get the value up there. Twenty. You can also assign values through pointers. So I could do something like this. Star IP is equal to 99. What do you think this is going to do? Right? This means go to the location that IP is pointing to and change its value to 99. Right? So go to location 101 and change the value there to 99. The value is now 99 at this location, right? This also had the effect of changing B, right? So I changed the value of B using this pointer. Makes sense. You can use these, you know, star IP in an expression, right? So you can do like star IP plus one. What's that going to give us? It would be 100 in this case, right? Go to where IP is pointing to, press 101, get the value that's there, 99, right? So this guy becomes 99, so 99 plus 1 is 100. So again, like you saw, we can have pointers to pointers. So I can have something like integer pointer IPP is equal to the address of IP. So what value goes here? 
Now I said equal to the address of IP. Oh, well, yes, I do need a double star, right? This address is going to be 103, so we get 103 in here. So now if I do this, star IP is equal to the address of P, not star IP, star IP. What's going to happen? Right, so break it down. This first line, of, this first half says go to where? What location? Go to wherever IPP is pointing to. IPP is pointing at location 103. So go to 103 and change the value there to be the address of C. So C's address is, right, so this guy becomes 102. Right? So now if I do star IP is equal to 7, what's going to happen? Right? So again, just do this line. This says go to what location of memory? It says go to where IP is pointing to. IP is pointing to location 102. So go to location 102, change the value there to 7. So P is now 7. I can also dereference a variable multiple times. I can dereference it based on how many stars it has. So I can do star IPP is equal to, say, uh, 13. What's going to happen here? Again, break it down. This first line says to do what? Right. Put some parentheses here. This says go to what location? Go to location 103 and get the value that's there. So this is 102. This says now go to location 102. Get the value, or go to location 102. Let C change the value to now becomes 13. And you can probably see why people start to get confused with this. Right? So one thing again that I find is really helpful is to draw something like this out that like keeps track of where your addresses are and what the values are supposed to be. And then when you're doing these statements, go to those locations. We will continue to do more examples with this this uh, evening. And hopefully, if life is good, we'll wrap it up. If not, we'll finish on Friday. Okay. I did. So like it's a function stack and then like the entire function is added at one full stack. So like all of this like all of this local variables are added to the stack, right? But think about the units on the stack is not in terms of the individual variables right now. Think about it in terms of the function. The entire function is added onto the stack. Okay. We have a function class, right? And that function can be kind of different variables A, B, and C. So it's more involved than just a stack. Yeah, it's a little bit more complicated. If you want like the full details, let's get to this. Okay. So it says error decoration changes the meaning of words from class. Oh, I think it's because uh, board and board are the same symbol. So if you hit it like a little case B, that can have it look confused. Because it sees basically it says class, class. Because uh, apparently it's allowed if you have like the ethical initial option turned on. So if you allow it, the compiler to be a little bit like more lax in terms of its checking, it's legal. But uh, the compiler on is a little bit more strict, so it's not going to go that. Yeah, so like what you can do is you can use go to like this line, uh, which is like line four main, and you just keep it for like little, little keyboard. It should be fine. This is the second one. This, this one is just saying that this declaration right here changes this definition. So, yeah, if you just change this to little b, it shouldn't contain any longer. 
No, I'll try to make so if you look like on the like the Google Drive links, there's one to like ECS30, I think. And so there are slides there about pointers. I also try to make some more for our class, but I just didn't have the time. What? Is that the same Yes. Um, oh, yeah. I think, right? So, what, 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 